right. Da, 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 da. Today's reading of the word is Ruth chapter 3. We are in Ruth chapter 3, therefore I shall read Ruth chapter 3. Hopefully you remember Ruth chapter 1 and 2, because this won't make a lot of sense if you don't. Then Naomi, the mother, uh, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is at the winnow he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go, uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law commanded. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk uh, and his heart was merry, and he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, uh, then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down at midnight. The man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lie at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made the last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask. For my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. Let, it be, let him do it. But if he, will not, uh, if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let, not, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing room floor. And he said, bring a garment you were wearing and hold it out. And so she held it out and he measured out six measures of barley and put it, uh, and put it on her. And she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn the matter and how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. All right. So we are coming to... The part of scripture in which Ruth shows her faith and her loyalty above all else. Let me set the scene very briefly for you. Um, Boaz is down working at the threshing floor. The threshing floor is kind of an area where you kind of beat the chaff out of the barley or the wheat, depending on the season. Um, the threshing floor is typically um, was placed at the west of the city. Multiple tribes multiple people multiple farmers would use kind of this big same area so it was kind of like a farm conglomeration if that's a thing like what i'm picturing in my mind i picture like a state fair where you have multiple different farmers that have all the livestock and people kind of all in one area well they all kind of harvest in one area and they did it in one spot because um during the seasons the air the wind would take the dry chaff and just kind of blow it away so they wouldn't have to clean up as much. It was a pretty unique area. And so they had harvested a bunch of barley at this time. They, have, they had harvested, they'll eventually harvest some wheat. Um, and Naomi says, this is your opportunity to make a connection with Boaz. And so she goes to Boaz at night. He is drunk, he has eaten, he is drunk, he did not drink wine. Boaz, it's important for us to understand that he is an honorable man. If we look at the rest of scripture, yes, this was set in the time of judges. Yes, judges said everyone did as they want. It was kind of a lawless area, but it's clear through scripture that Boaz was not that man. He was faithful to God. He followed his practices. 
And so we have a scene here where Boaz has done eating, he's worked a hard day, he's exhausted. Most of the farmers stayed out with their crop during this time. They camped near it, not only to protect it, but also by the time they were done, they didn't want to have to walk all the way back because they were coming back out in the morning. Um, so they had gotten done, he ate, he drank, he was relaxed. And then Ruth shows up. Ruth comes up to him, she uncovers his feet, and she lays down at his feet. Now, in our modern ears, that sounds strange. And when you hear modern <clears throat> scholars try to describe it, they try to put a modern spin to this story. They'll say, oh, this is scandalous. Ruth was trying to seduce Boaz. Look at this. This is scandalous. And some people might think that if you have zero understanding of Jewish history and culture, and if you prefer to take Ruth completely out of context. What this moment was, Ruth uncovering his feet and laying at his feet, was a sign of submission and a plea for leadership. She was saying, I am submitting to you and to your authority. That's what this moment was. She was asking for him to marry her, not in some other modern conventional way that most people couples live but in a way of saying i can't do this on my own because it goes back to the previous point that we had talked about for quite a while it was very dangerous to be a widow during this period there were not a lot of options for you people scream about the patriarchy existing now well back then good luck if you were a woman and you didn't have a husband because land was tied to heirs and inheritance. Boaz had a farm. He could provide for himself. He was, by all accounts, a wealthy man. Ruth had no nothing. She had no property. Uh, we find out next chapter that she had maybe a little bit of land to her name that was tied to Naomi's husband. That was part of the redeeming process, but I'll explain the physical redeeming process next week because you've got to have a sermon next week, right? can't do it both this week and next week. Um, but for the most part, Ruth struggled with prospects. Naomi really didn't have a lot of prospects because she was older, but Ruth was struggling with prospects because she was, a, she was previously married. She's a widow. There's a reason why many people gave to the temple to help support widows because it was very hard for them to do it themselves. So this was a plea from Ruth saying, I need help. I am very much a converted Jew in this land. I have no family inheritance that I can tie back to any of the 12 tribes of Israel on my own. I need your help. This was a moment in which Ruth was bold in love, not only to Naomi, but eventually to Boaz, to loyalty, not only to Naomi, but also to God, faith, because she turned to Boaz in an unconventional manner, manner and sought his hand, essentially in marriage. And courage, because I don't care who you are, this had to have been uncomfortable to do. Raise your hand if you tried to ask someone out on a date before. It's terrifying, right? Yeah, it's not comfortable. Notice none of the girls' hands went up, except one, sorry. I asked Derek out, thank you. You asked Derek out. <laughs> no log that one away. <laughs> Yeah, they always do, right? Yeah. Anyway, so it's a very uncomfortable situation. Ruth had to have courage to do this. But Ruth saw and knew something that we can take away from this. She needed a redeemer. That is the heart of this passage. It's not about the Jewish way of life, necessarily. It's not about Boaz being this great, big individual who... He's part of Jesus' lineage, so that's pretty good in the grander scheme of things. But it is about Ruth needing a redeemer. This moment is a foreshadowing of things to come. In this story with Ruth, we see our need for redemption through Christ. That is the connection that we want to make today. Ruth could not save herself. 
Naomi could not save themselves. Life, culture, inheritance, family, property law, you name it, was stacked against her. She couldn't dig herself out of what she was in. So she had faith, she had courage, she had love, and she turned and said, help me. That is how most, if not all of us, come to Christ. It is when we realize that we cannot save ourselves that we turn to find a redeemer in Christ. I remember the moment vividly in which I realized this because believing in Jesus and needing Jesus to save you are two very different things. There are a lot of people out there who believe in Jesus. They believe he lived. The historical evidence is overwhelming. You almost have to be a fool to think that the guy never lived, but there's fools out there. There's more sources to confirm that Jesus Christ lived, died, and that people followed him, believing that he rose from the grave, than there is that Abraham Lincoln lived. That's a staggering fact when you think about 2,000 years ago versus 150 years ago. But the evidence is overwhelming, biblical and extra-biblical support. It is an objective fact that Yeshua lived during this time. But believing that Jesus lived and existed is not the same, as I said, as being saved by him. Being saved by him requires you to understand that you need something to be saved from. And I remember the moment in which this connected for me, and it came up, and I figured I'd share it here. I was still living in Reno, and I was starting to work through scripture for the very first time. I don't think I would identify myself as a Christian, though. If you asked me that, I probably would say that I was. But looking back now, I probably wasn't a Christian. Um, uh, my good friend and mentor, Pastor Mike, uh, gave me the best advice he ever did. When I started to say, I want to learn more about Jesus, he said, read Matthew. If you want to know why I always go to Matthew with a lot of things, it's because Matthew, in a very real sense, saved me. And so I'm connected to it. And so I said, all right, I'll read Matthew. He's like, and we'll talk about it. On lunch breaks, we'll go out to lunch, we'll talk about it. Just start reading Matthew. He's like, I don't want to give you contacts, pre pretense, just read it. And a strange thing happened. I was reading it, and I don't remember if it was the first time or the fifth time, but I was reading through Matthew. Um, and following that night, I, I closed the book, I fell asleep, and I had the worst nightmare of my life. And I remember it so vividly. I was driving in a car with Amber, uh, Kira was in the back. I think it was only Kira. I believe it was only Kira in the dream because Zachary didn't exist yet. But Kira was in the back. Uh, and we were driving along and we were driving through Texas, which is strange. Oh, my microphone. We were driving through Texas, which is strange because I'd never been to Texas before. I had no connection to Texas. But I was driving through Texas. And then all of a sudden, the ground gave way. It was covered in dust. And when the dust settled, the highway had broken almost like a, think like a big square sinkhole. And the sides were too high for me to see on either way. Like the road was up there, but I wasn't getting up there anymore. And so I got out of the car. I told Amber and Kira to stay in the car. And I got out of the car and I got to the front of it. And then all of a sudden I saw the ground in front of me rumble. And I saw this gentleman, I use the term loosely, stand kind of on the top and he was wearing an all black suit. Looked just like the person. And he said, now let's see how hungry the earthworm is. And he said it in a loud, booming voice. And then all of a sudden, this giant, monstrous earthworm came right out of the ground and started tunneling towards us. Scary, right? That's why I fish with rubber lures now. <laughs> and through this moment, I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. How do I know? How I can help my family? This thing was big enough to eat the vehicle. There's nothing I could do. I couldn't go around. I was completely helpless. There was nothing I could do. And I had a moment where I said, all right, I, I can't do this on my own. And then I woke up. And that was it. That was my dream. And you know how some of you have had nightmares before? This is like the nightmare of nightmares. You know how some of you had nightmares before and you wake up and you realize after a second, you're like, oh, that was a dream. And that was so ridiculous. Like, how could that ever have happened? Because you're like, wait a second. I don't have a duck bill. What was that I was dreaming about? This is strange. This wasn't like this for me. It didn't feel like a dream. It felt like prophecy. I remember colors. I remember smells. I would have remembered taste if I ate anything. Everything was real. Everything was vivid. I felt like if I found a map or I went to a place that looked like that, it would have exactly been that. 
I don't generally dream in color and I can control my dreams and it felt more like an experience than a dream. I did not wake up feeling like I dreamt this. I woke up feeling like I experienced this. And the only thing that I heard in my head was, I can't save myself. I can't do it on my own. I couldn't help my family. And that invested me to immediately read. I remember that night vividly reading much more of Matthew. And when I went back, it was two days later, I went back to see Mike when we worked the same shift, and I told him what I went through in a dream. And he's like, yeah, it's weird, right? I'm like, 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 a, like just a natural fact. He's like, yeah. When you start digging into scripture, you feel real weird things. Stuff happens, especially if you read scripture with eyes that aren't Christian. And that was the moment where following that dream, following that moment, I absolutely gave myself to Christ. It would still be months before I was baptized, but I knew after that moment that I had given my life because I realized I couldn't save myself. I couldn't redeem myself. This is the moment that Ruth is in. Ruth could not save herself. And when we read this story, I pray that we see Christ because we must be redeemed. We are promised all through the Gospels that, that, that this is who he is. If you, you don't have to turn to me because I'll go through, uh, quick through it. If you turn to John Gospel, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, we see this is Jesus' identity. John the Baptist is baptizing people in the water, telling them, wait for him to come, wait for him to come. And when Jesus arrives, we see in verse 29, the next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the role of Christ. He takes our sin if we are willing to give it to him. If we are willing to be saved by him, he will take it from us. That is his role. That is his nature. The Apostle Paul, when writing his letter to the Ephesians, reminded us of this. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul's giving a big speech of who Jesus is. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We are saved by Christ not because we deserve it or because we've earned it, but because he died on the cross for us. It is by his grace we are saved, not our own. Similar to Boaz, he didn't have to do it. Boaz could have just told Ruth to leave. Moabite, come on, quit wasting my time. But he didn't. He loved her when she was in need. And finally, I want to pull up 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 from you. We've talked about John pointing this out in his gospel. We've talked about Paul mentioning it in his epistles. Let's see Peter's take on this understanding. When we go to verse 18, I'll go a little bit higher so that you can see it connected. I'll go to 17. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from, a, from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but the precious blood of Christ like the lamb without blemish or spot. Peter is reminding his whole audience, and he has a tinge to the Jewish population here as he points to forefathers, his whole audience that your salvation, your saving from the great worm, whatever theologically that could have meant to the 20-something self of my, my, my psyche, wasn't paid for my money. Nobody tossed in a hundred dollars into an offering plate so that you could be saved. Nobody is going to give you a check to turn to Christ. God's not going to bless you with immeasurable money just so that you respect him. No, it was paid for with something far more precious than that, his blood. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was the only human person in the history of mankind that didn't deserve to die for their sins. 
He had to be fully God to do that. He was the only one worthy of life, and yet he took the cross so that all of us could find life. That's what I want you to take away from today's message. Ruth chapter 3, there can be a lot of stuff in there to distract you. If you turn from one commentary to the other, they'll tell you that uncovering your feet means this, means that. It doesn't. It's about Ruth's, Ruth's character and her loyalty. She turned in submission to Boaz as we are now called to turn in submission to Christ. Because Boaz is her redeemer, Christ is our redeemer. That is the heart of this passage. I pray that you do well to remember that and remind yourself of that. You will not have peace, you will have peace in Christ. You will not necessarily have comfort you may not have happiness all the time, but you will have peace, you will have love, and you'll have eternity if you turn to him. If you give him your trials, you give him your sins, you give him your sufferings, you let him redeem you. Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you be with all of us and that we may know in our hearts that you have redeemed us. And if, Lord, we struggle with that still, if we are holding on to some sin that we think separates us from you, some shame hidden somewhere, Lord, I pray that you expose it to us so that we may confess it, so that there be, there be nothing between us and your grace and your glory, Lord. Your son went to the cross so that we may live, and I pray that we live in abundance, faithful to you. Look after us, guide us, protect us. Let us always be reminded of you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your Son. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you 